So good afternoon. Um, so I'll be presenting BuildRoot, a tool that helps building embedded Linux systems in an easy way. And also probably one of the projects that is the ugliest logo possible. Um, but that's not really the point. Uh, before we get started, uh, a quick poll. Uh, who in the room is either working or playing with embedded Linux? Yeah, so a good number of people, like more than half of the room. Okay, great. So um, first, who am I? In a quick few words. I'm the CTO and embedded Linux engineer in a company called Free Electrons. Uh, we do embedded Linux stuff, uh, both development and consulting and training. We have a strong open source focus, so we contribute to the Linux kernel, for example, to build root. And we also release all our training materials under a Creative Commons license. So we have lots of embedded Linux and Linux kernel training course material freely available for everyone to download. I am an open source contributor. I contribute to the Linux kernel, um, especially on the ARM um, support for certain processors, namely the ones for, from Marvel. And I'm also a major contributor to BuildRoot, who is in fact not uh, 1600 but 1900 uh, patches contributed since uh, the last few years. And I come from Toulouse in France, so quite far away, and you've probably noticed my terrible accent. So embedded, um, these days when people say embedded, usually they, th they think something like that, like phones, tablets, consumer grade devices. And those devices, they typically have very powerful CPUs, lots of RAM, lots of storage, a full feature general purpose operating system, usually Android, but it can be something else, but something with like many applications that you can install, remove, upgrade, and so on. So really a complete desktop operating system. But in fact, embedded is much more than just the devices that you have in your pocket. We have embedded systems in like laser cutting machines, uh, point of sale terminals, agriculture machines, windmills, and, and many other systems that you may never have, have heard of. And those systems are uh, much more application specific, so they need a more custom Linux system that may need to boot fast or meet some real time deadlines or have other types of constraints. They usually have a lot less powerful CPUs. Um, typically, like in the a few hundreds of megahertz, is quite common in those systems. Uh, they may use like specialized CPU architectures. So there's much more than x86 and ARM in the in the embedded world. Uh, MIPS for PC, of course, but also like Blackfin, Microblaze, NIOS, and other bizarre architectures you've probably never heard of. Those systems have also less RAM, less storage, and a long lifetime and maintenance period. So the constraints are quite different than the ones that we have in consumer grade devices such as phones and tablets. And so the way we're gonna create the Linux systems for those two types of embedded systems might be a little bit different as we're going to see. So to build an embedded Linux system to like um, integrate all the different components that make a Linux system, uh, the init system, the, the graphic call stack and the network processes and so on, there are different solutions that are available. The first thing that every one of us do um, is use binary Linux distributions, Debian, Ubuntu, or more specialized one like Raspbian for Raspberry Pi or other distributions. So those are pre-built. So what you get are binaries that have been compiled by others, other people. So the, the good thing is that it's readily available. It's easy to install, easy to use, but it's quite large. It's not available for all architectures. It's not necessarily very easy to customize. So of course, you can install and remove packages, but if you want to like, slightly adjust the config of one package or rebuild the entire thing with different compiler options, it's a little bit tricky. And it generally requires native compilation. So if any one of you have tried to build a Linux kernel on a Raspberry Pi, it takes a long, long while. So native compilation is certainly nice for some things, but for some other things, it's not so nice. So the other approach is the other um, side of the spectrum is to build everything manually. So from scratch, you take the, the source code for every component in your system, take the turbo, configure it, build it, install it, and do all of that stuff. But it's quite hard because you, have, you are going to face cross-compilation issues. You'll have to face the resolution of the dependency tree. And in the open source world, we reuse a lot of things, so there are many libraries. It's not reproducible unless you take very well clear notes of what you've done, and you don't benefit from other people's work. So there's kind of an intermediate solution that sits in between. And of course, as you might have guessed, build root fits in that intermediate solution. Uh, this intermediate solution is the usage of tools that automate the process of building a Linux system from scratch, from source code, all the way to a completely working system. 
So since we uh, build from source, um, we can customize as we want. We can build very small and flexible uh, systems, so we can just have what we need inside the system and nothing more. It makes the process reproducible because we have a tool instead of just a bunch of command lines that we run. The tool handles the cross compilation and dependency issues. It's visually available for all architectures. We're going to see which ones build root support. But of course, it's one tool to learn and you have to, well, spend some time um, waiting for the build to finish, but at least you are not involved in, into that. So you can drink some coffee or other nice drinks uh, while the build is going on. So the principle of those tools is, there are many tools in this, well, uh, area, uh, but the principle of all the, of those tools is more or less the same. Basically, they take some source code, either from open source components or in-house components, uh, from their Git trees or tarballs on, on the web. And they are going to produce, at the end, a root file system image that contains all your application and libraries and init scripts and config files and so on. Possibly a kernel image, a bootloader image, and a cross-compilation tool chain. And you're going to feed in, into this tool a configuration that says, for my system, I'm going to build it for ARM, and I want this graphical library to be inside, and this networking application, and so on and so on. So as I said, you build from source, so you have lots of flexibility. You can adjust whatever configuration option for each individual component as you want. Since we're cross-compiling everything, uh, we are leveraging the power of our fast desktop and server machines. So you can like have a big Intel machine to do all your cross-compilation, which allows you to build a kernel for your Raspberry Pi in just a few minutes instead of a few hours if you do native compilation on the target. And those tools have recipes for building components, so it makes it easy. Instead of having to worry about how to compile x.org, you just select an option and it's going to do it for you because the tool knows how to build x.org. So there is a wide range of tools available to do that. Yocto and Open Embedded, PTX Dist, Build Root, LTIB, OpenBricks, OpenWRT, and much more that I've probably forgot. But from what I can see, but of course I'm, I have a biased opinion here, uh, I think two solutions are really emerging as the most popular ones. On one side, there is Yocto and Open Embedded. Uh, what those tools allow is to build a complete Linux distribution with binary packages. So it produces like your own custom Debian for you. And then from this set of packages, you can create embedded Linux systems that are able to upgrade, install, remove applications through binary packages as you normally do in a binary distribution. These tools are very powerful, but they are somewhat complex and have a quite steep learning curve. So if you want to invest quite some time, they are certainly nice. Uh, Buildroot is kind of the, the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, it si simply builds a root file system image. There is no binary packages. You can't like install, upgrade, remove things. If you want to change something, you have to go back into the tool, adjust your configuration, and recreate a new root file system image, which is perfectly fine for most of the embedded Linux systems that are used in the industrial space. And it's also a tool that's much, much simpler to use, understand, and modify as we're going to see throughout the, the presentation. So in just a few words, what are the main characteristics of build root? It's a tool that can build a tool chain, a root file system, a kernel, a bootloader. It's an embedded Linux build system. It's easy to configure because it uses a mini config, x config, n config, g config interface, just like the Linux kernel itself. So if you've ever built a Linux kernel, you already know the configuration interface for build root. It's fast. You can build a simple root file system in just a few minutes. So you don't have to wait for hours. It's very easy to understand because it's written in Make and it has pretty good documentation. Of course, it could be better, but it's, we have good documentation, I believe. Um, the default file system that it, that it builds, um, it weights two megabytes. So it's, when I say small, I really mean small. So it just contains a um, small C library, and, uh, which is UCLipsy and BuzzyBox, and that's all. And then you can add more stuff on top of it, but at least you start with something small. It has more than 1,000 packages um, available, so you can just select things and you don't have to worry about how to actually compile it. And there are many architectures supported. It uses well-known technologies. As I've said, it's based on make, so it's entirely written in make files. Um, and it uses kconfig for the configuration interface. So any like kernel developer or Linux developer in general knows this technology already. 
It's also a vendor neutral tool. So it's not like one single company behind the tool doing the development or driving the directions. It's really an open source community doing it. And it's probably the oldest um, build system still in activity. It's been created in 2001, actually. So it's quite old. And the community is very active, regular releases. I'm going to talk more about that a bit later. So who's using BuildRoot? Google is using BuildRoot. They do Google Fiber in the US and the boxes. Um, they have an embedded Linux system and they use BuildRoot to produce it. Barco is a um, well, international company doing visualization systems. Rockwell Collins, they work in the defense and aerospace industry and they also use BuildRoot and they're even contributing to it. And we have many more, I just took like three examples. We also have a lot of processor vendors that are using BuildRoot as their BSP. So they provide their customers a BuildRoot that is specifically configured for their own architectures. So like analog devices for Blackfin, imagination technologies for MIPS, uh, Marvel at Mail for ARM, and there are several others. And also many, many hobbyists that do embedded Linux development on, on boards like Raspberry Pi or Beaglebone Black and so on find BuildRoot really nice because it's easy and simple. So how do you get started with BuildRoot? Well, you just grab it from the Git repo. Well, there are stable releases, of course, but it's probably easy, easier with the Git repo. And then you fire make menu config and you have the well, well-known menu config interface to configure all the different aspects of the embedded Linux system you're going to produce. So I'm going to go through pretty quickly um, on the different, uh, well, configuration aspects that are available. So first you need to select the architecture. And as you can see, there are several of them that are uh, supported, including like ARM64 or SuperH or NIOS2 that are quite weird architectures and all the more common ones are available. And then in this part, you can also select more specific options uh, specific to each architecture, like the type of processor and what type of floating point strategy and so on. There are some like build options where uh, build is gonna download the tarballs, how many things you do in parallel, whether you want your C cache and that kind of things. Uh, another very important part is the tool chain, which cross compiler you're going to use. And you have two options here. Either BuildRoot can build its own cross compiler, in which case it's going to build uh, GCC and the C library and the build shells and so on. And it supports uslibc, glibc, and eglibc as the different C libraries. Um, or the other option is to use what we call an external tool chain, where you already have a cross compiler that's known to work really well for your architecture. And you can just tell BuildRoot to use it. And the other advantage of using an external tool chain is that you don't have to pay the, the price of building the tool chain, which takes quite a while. So you say like maybe 20 minutes to 30 minutes of build time if you use an existing tool chain. Um, then you have um, a way of doing some system-wide configuration, like which init system you want to use, whether you want to use BuzzyBox as the init system, which is the default because that's very small, or if you want to use SystemD or a more traditional uh, System 5 init. You can select how you want to handle slash dev, like whether you want to use udev or dev tmpfs, there are various solutions. And other, well, system-wide configuration options, like what's the root password and whether you want a shell to run on some serial port and so on. Then you can define which kernel should be built, uh, like which version, whether it, it's come from a Git repository or whether there are patches which configuration should be applied, so it can be given as a file or as a dev config. And we have support for um, the two, well, probably most popular real-time extensions like RTAI and Xenomai, so it can be integrated easily in build root as well. And then the most important part is definitely the target packages, what you're going to put in your uh, root file system, that's where, um, well, the, the highest value of the embedded Linux build systems is. And that's where we have more than 1,000 packages so we have things like Qt4, 5, x.org, gtk, efl. So that means by, that by simply selecting an option in the menu config, you can get Qt5 built uh, for your target platform without having to worry on how you sh actually need to configure it and compile it and how to install all the stuff. We have things like GStreamer, FFmpeg, many um, interpreted languages, many networking applications. We have, uh, since uh, Google Summer of Code last summer, we have OpenGL support for various platforms and many, many, many libraries and utilities. Uh, there are too many to name all of them, obviously. Um, another part of the configuration is, is which file system format you want to generate. So we support things like ext2, 3.4, of, of course, but also more embedded specific file systems like UBIFS or GFFS2 for flashes. 
or Chrome F well, Squash FS for read-only um, file system. So this morning, someone was asking during the lightning talk, I'm having like um, file system corruptions on Raspberry Pi for some museum exhibitions and so on. So typically a good answer would be do something with Squash FS and BuildWood can by default generate a root file system that remains read-only. So if it's read-only, obviously you kind of limit the, well, the, the occurrence of file system corruptions. Um, going the wrong directions. You can also build bootloaders, so depending on which architectures you use, um, the bootloader will be different, but we support Grab, Sys Linux, U-Boot, Box, and a bunch of platform-specific bootloaders. So really you define all the aspects of your embedded Linux system. Uh, there are also the possibility of building some native tools that are useful for development, but it's kind of a, a side thing. Um, here is an example configuration. So just like the Linux kernel, the configuration gets saved in a file named .config, which is just a text file that says for each option what's the value. So here is the configuration for the Raspberry Pi. So it's going to build a kernel for an ARM platform with an external tool chain. It's going to include the uh, Raspberry Pi firmware and New Zealand, um, well, proprietary binaries, uh, the I2C tools, and then um, a the TV head end streaming server and, and the drop bear SSH server and the light HTTPD uh, web server. And just with this configuration, it's going to produce you directly an image that you can use on your Raspberry Pi. Um, so to start the build, you run make, and that's the point where you drink uh, one or two or three cup of coffee or tea, depending on your taste. And at the end of this process, in the output images directory, that's where the uh, real stuff um, gets put at the end of the build process. You have the root file system image. So here um, I've selected both a tarball format and a UBI format, which is for, for some embedded system. You have the kernel image and the U-boot bootloader image. Of course, it completely depends on your configuration. But that's really what needs to be flashed or installed to your target system, like pushed to your SD card or flashed in some way to your um, embedded Linux platform. Uh, I'm going in the wrong direction again. So if you want to have a look at the build output of what BuildWood generates, it all goes in the output directory by default, but that can be changed using O equal to do out of tree build, exactly like the kernel. And output contains um, output build, where BuildWood is going to extract the source code for each and every component is going to build. So for like GCC, BuzzyBox, and Light HTTPD, and so on. And that's where it's going to build each of them. Output host is where BuildWood installs all the host utilities. So like when you build things for the target, you need things for the host. For example, the cross compiler, but there are many other to tools that you will need. So it's going to install them here. In output host user, the tuple of your architecture, so typically something like ARM, unknown, Linux, like new ABI, sysroot, it's where uh, BuildWood's going to install all the headers and the libraries that have been built for the targets. And it allows the cross compiler to find them and build more libraries and more applications on top of the libraries that have been built previously. That's what allows to, well, solve the dependency tree. Output target, it's what contains almost the target root file system. So why almost? It's because since build root does not run as root, we cannot really create completely the root file system. The permissions and the file ownership are wrong, but we fix that up later when we create the real images. So that this directory cannot be used directly as the root file system, but it's really almost like it. And then, as I said, output images where you find the uh, final images that are interesting. So the build process um, is Pretty simple. Of course, if you go into the details, it's more a bit more complicated, but the, the overall overview of the, um, the uh, build process is quite simple. Buildroot starts by copying what we call the root file system skeleton to the target directory. So the root file system skeleton is just like an empty root file system. It is just like etc and bin and lib, completely empty, just a bunch of config files in etc, and that's, that's pretty much it. Then it takes care of the cross-compilation toolchain, and as I said, there are two solutions, either let BuildRoot build your toolchain or use an external toolchain. And in both cases, BuildRoot takes care of what's needed to either build it or like import the already existing toolchain. And then for each of the selected packages, it's going to first take care of its dependencies. So it's going to do this third step recursively for each of the packages. And it, for each of them, it's going to download the source code and potentially some patches, extract them, apply the patches, configure it, build the, the components, and install it. And it's going to install it in different locations, depending on the, the specific component you're building. 
For target application and libraries, they are obviously going to be installed in output slash target, so they end up in your root file system and show up in your um, target platform at the end. Um, the target libraries also are installed in the sysroot so that they get seen by the cross compiler when you build more application and more libraries, as I was saying. And in output host, that's where we install all the na native libraries and applications, like the cross compiler itself, but so also more, more things like, I don't know if you need Flex or Bison to build something, they are going to be installed in there. And finally, once that process is done for all the packages that you've selected, taking care of the dependencies and ordering the build properly, it's going to generate the root file system image and your system is ready to use. So here are two real-time, uh, no real-time, but real-world examples of projects that uh, I've done uh, using BuildRoot. So one of them was um, for a company making a device based on an ARM uh, Atmel uh, CPU, which was like 200 or 400 megahertz maybe, like 64 megs of RAM, so pretty, pretty limited. Uh, and in this device, um, it was used to like track uh, things going on using GPS, RFID readers, uh, GSM modem, Ethernet, and USB. And in the system, we had like, um, we used um, a Glibc toolchain pre-built, pre so we didn't have to spend time building it. A Linux kernel, Buzzy Box for the basic stuff, an SSH uh, server and clients. We had the basic Qt library, not the graphical part, but all the core. Uh, and some more components like PPPD for GSM inter interaction and some special RFID library and other things. The Qt application that was really making the system do whatever it was designed for. And we generated a GFFS2 file system. And the file system was 11 megabytes in size with all these components. And it was actually using glibc, which could be made a little bit smaller if we used uslibc. And to build all that stuff, it, it was taking 10 minutes on a, well, quite core i7 build machine, which isn't like, it's good, but it's not uh, exceptionally, um, well, enormous in terms of CPU power. Um, another, one, another one is a system that's based on x86, uh, which is used for um, a vehicle nav navigation system that ma mainly runs an OpenGL application showing what's going on, 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 on in the area. So here we used a, a glibc toolchain that was pre prepared with a tool cross called Cross2LNG, which is specialized in the creation of cross compilation toolchain. So that again, build root doesn't have to spend the time to rebuild the tool chain over and over again. Um, we use the group grub bootloader, Linux kernel, obviously, and BuzzyBox. It's kind of always the same thing. Uh, we had a large part of the x.org stack. And there was one interesting thing here is that this project was using an ATI uh, card, which is proprietary driver for um, the OpenGL implementation. And those drivers were dependent on a very specific version of the kernel and a very specific version of x.org. And thanks to the fact that we're building everything from source, it's pretty easy to select very precisely which version of each component you want in the system, which sometimes is a little bit more complicated when you have uh, binary distributions. Of course, you could use like an older Debian, but then everything is older. While here we can have everything recent except just the, the very specific libraries or version of the x.org server. So the flexibility of building from source is sometimes very useful. And then we had a bunch of libraries like Alza stuff and B4L and so on and so on, and the OpenGL application. And in the end, the file system was 95 megabytes, which is quite huge. But if you look at what's made this size, uh, there's actually 10 megs of app and 45 megs of the ATI driver. I don't know what they do exactly in their drivers and OpenGL implementation, but it's, it's crazy. And this system was taking 27 minutes to build on a the same build server, quad core i7. So it's pretty reasonable. I mean, you, of course, you need to drink a little bit of coffee, but not too much. Um, so be besides uh, selecting the different packages, there are uh, different ways you can customize the build because, well, packages are interesting, obviously, but uh, possibly you need to add more configuration files or adjust things in the root file system. And there are different ways to do that. Um, BuildRoot provides what we call post-build and post-image scripts. So in the build process, which I can basically go back here, uh, you can um, ask BuildRoot to execute a script before 0.4 and after 0.4, which is respectively post-build and post-image. So before uh, the image is created, uh, you can like add more files in the root file system, adjust configuration files, do, remove things, and do whatever customization you want. And after the images are created, you can maybe 
uh, bundle them together to create a firmware image update that will be pushed to your customers or whatever. That's one way. And we have another way which is called the root file system overlay. It's kind of related. It's basically uh, you tell build root, here is a directory that contains stuff and once the build is done, just take this stuff and copy it inside the root file system. So you can put all your uh, custom config files, custom init scripts, custom maybe even application or whatever in there and it's going to be part of the build and, and taken by build root into the root file system. And the last way uh, you can use to customize the build is by adding your own, your own packages, either to package open source components that are not yet handled in build root or your own in-house components because you need to integrate your own libraries, your own applications into the build. And so I'm going to show quickly uh, what it looks like to create a new package in, uh, in build root. So first of all, you have to make your package appear in the menu config interface. And here, uh, thanks to the fact that we use the, the exact same code base as the kernel for the kconfig uh, base, um, well, it's exactly the same as defining configuration options inside the kernel. So any person having a little bit of kernel development experience knows how to do that. If you don't have a kernel development experience, as you can see, it's pretty easy. So here I'm showing the libmicro httpd package. So basically we're defining a um, config symbol and naming the option, that, that's what will appear in menu config. Define the dependencies, so here this package has no specific dependencies except that the toolchain should provide thread support. A description and then we have a little comment that says, hey, your toolchain doesn't have threads so you can't enable libmicro httpd. Once this is done, and obviously this should be done in a directory that's named after the package, so package slash libmicrohttpd slash config.in. Once you've done that, you need to go to the upper level config.in, which includes all the config.ins for all the different packages and add a new include. So it's source and the name of the file we just created before. So that's the easy part. And then you need to describe actually how to build that package. So how to extract it, how to configure it, how to build it, how to install it. But it turns out that libmicrohttpd uses the autoconf and automake. So the way to build it and configure it is very standardized. So instead of repeating that for each and every package in build root, you, have, you can use what we call a package infrastructure, which is named autotools package, and which is going to factorize um, all these, the gory details of building an autotools package and do all of that for you. So what we have to do here is just give a bunch of, of variables, uh, values, uh, the version of the component, where it, it can be downloaded from. Uh, we can also give the license. I'm going to get back to that later. We are saying that it should be installed to staging. This means that it's going to be installed both in the target and in the sysroot of the tool chain because it's a library. So if we want the cross compiler to see that library for upcoming compilations, uh, then we need to tell that. And then we can, we can pass configuration options to the uh, configure script. I've stripped down the real thing because here we handle things in the real build root, we handle things like optional SSL support, for example. So if we see that we have OpenSSL available, we pass one more option to, to, to tell uh, libmicrohttpd, please enable SSL support. And that's, that's all what you need. That, that will create the, the, the package. It will automatically download the tarball, extract it, and it will configure it, build it, install it. But that's, so that's all what you need for Autodulls packages. So we have different package infrastructures depending on the type of package you want to create. If your component uses Autotools, it's Autotools package, as I've shown. If your component uses CMake, then we have CMake package. If your component is a Python module using either Destutils or Setup Tools, we have Python package recently that we've I've recently integrated. And, um, and then for all the rest, we have an infrastructure called generic package where you have to do a little bit more work because you have to explicitly say what should happen to configure and build the package. And it, what's coming is infrastructure for Perl and Lua packages. So we're progressively improving those package infrastructures to make it simpler to package Perl and Lua stuff. Um, be beyond building the, the system itself that you run on your um, target platform, another thing that uh, BuildRoot provides is what we call a legal infrastructure. So as you've seen in the example, the, the libmicrohttp package is associated with licensing information, like which license and which file describes the license. 
And we have that for not yet all of the packages because that's something we've introduced like less than a year ago. Uh, but it's growing and I think more, more than half of our packages have licensing information. So what we can do is that when you run make legal info, it's going to extract the legal information for all the packages that you've selected in your embed Linux system. And it's going to provide you a licensing manifest in a CSV format saying all the components, all their version, all their licenses so that you can very easily do uh, licensing compliance. It's going to store in one directory the license for all the different components and the source code for all the different components. So if all of this is right, technically you can just take all that stuff, put that up on your website, and you should normally be compliant with the open source licenses that, that you use in your, in your system. At least that's the, that's the idea. So I think that's a pretty cool feature for uh, companies doing embedded Linux systems. Um, it, well, it uses the, directly the embedded uh, Linux build system tool to help in doing license compliance. It can also uh, do dependency graphing. So that's very interesting to understand why a particular component has been taken into the build. So uh, you do make graph depends and it generates a PDF that looks like that for the, I think it's the Raspberry Pi system that's the configuration I, I was showing before. So it's, I'm not sure you can read, but um, we can see that, that there is BuzzyBox, it's building the kernel, and the kernel needs a bunch of things. It's building light HTTPD, which needs some other stuff, and so on and so on. So we can very easily understand why a component has been brought into the build. Uh, another thing that's, um, that comes with build roots are dev configs. So it's pretty much like the kernel ones. Um, dev configs are configurations for popular platforms. And in Build Root, we've decided to have configuration that build a minimal system for the platform. So, for example, we have configuration for the Raspberry Pi, for the BeagleBone, for the QB board, for Panda board, for many Atmel boards, Freescale boards, uh, and also for many QMU configurations, so that you can like experiment with Build Root and run things in QMU ARM, QMU MIPS, QMU Spark, and we have many, many of them, like tens of them. And uh, it builds the most minimal system possible. So like the two megs uh, root file system I was um, um, well explaining before, it is just the C library and buzzy box and that's it. And then on top of that, you can um, add more packages depending on what you want to do with your system. Some people will use their Raspberry Pi to do a media center. Some other people will do it to, will use it to maybe monitor the temperature in their house or something. So the set of packages will depend from one usage to the other. But at least those dev configs, they build the right kernel, the right bootloader, select the right architecture options, and so on, and give you a system that is known to boot on this platform. So to use them, you just do make blah blah dev config. So like make Raspberry Pi dev config. It's going to load that default configuration. And you start the build by running make, and it's going to produce you a system that runs on your Raspberry Pi. Um, as I said before, BuildWood is an active project. It, it, has, a quite, it has had a quite um, uh, Ectic history uh, with periods of um, without any maintainer, things going quite bad and so on. But since, um, you know, f uh, yeah, five years now, it's since the um, beginning of 2009, we have a maintainer, uh, Peter Korsgaard, uh, who lives in Belgium. And he is the gatekeeper for all the changes going into build root. So, a bit like in the Linux kernel, there's only one person having commit access to the Git repository. We review patches in a mailing list and so on. So since he's, he has been um, leading the project, we have published releases every three months, uh, very regularly. They have always been in time, so it's pretty, pretty good for users to know that, well, every three months we care about stability. So we basically have two months of development and then one month for uh, bug fixing. We have a growing number of contributors. These days we have between 35 and 40 different contributors. Um, each month that have patches integrated into the tree. So we have, in fact, many more contributors sending patches, but for the patches that are accepted, it's like 40, yeah, 30, 40 people each month. Um, mailing list activity is also showing that the project is um, gaining uh, interest, like on between one, 1,500 and 2,200 emails a month, and it's growing. And the number of packages is also growing. So as you've seen, it, it's been flat for a while. Um, which was several years ago because we have had a huge period of cleanup uh, when the new maintainer was, well, appointed. And we cleaned up a lot of things, like rewrote most of it. 
and now we are in a, f a phase where uh, we can benefit from the cleanup and add many more packages, which is what's happening right now. And uh, we have um, uh, physical meetings twice a year. So here it was um, last year, February, in Brussels, in the um, Google offices, because since they use Build Roots, they are nice enough to provide us uh, meeting rooms. And so we have like developer meetings, and we're going to have again one in, in Google offices in Brussels um, just next month, um, in early February. So if you want to try out Build Roots, um, uh, there is a pretty good documentation, as I said, uh, that's available, especially uh, describing how to add packages. Uh, it's very, uh, describe things in, with a lot of details. And like any other um, good open source project, we have, as I said, the ugly logo, but we also have the mailing list, uh, the RC channel, a bug tracker. I'm tempted to think that our community is quite fr friendly and welcoming. I mean, it's, since it's a, a tool that's pretty easy, a lot of the people that come in are usually newcomers in the embedded Linux space, and we try to be nice with them and explain them how things work and so on. And there are also companies offering commercial support around Build Root. So to conclude and, and uh, leave some time for the questions, um, I have like eight minutes. Um, I think it's a nice tool uh, and because it uses well-known technologies and languages. You don't have to learn some funky language to uh, use it and the community is active and friendly. It's simple. If you want to understand what Build Root does, it's just a few hundreds of lines of code to understand. They are not the easiest part of build root indeed, but the core of the package infrastructure is really just a few hundred lines of code. So even newcomers, after just a few months of like playing around with build root, they are able to provide patches that touch the core of build root because it remains simple. And that's something that is really key in the project. Whenever we have a request from users for new features, we always try to uh, see whether the, the request for that feature fits in the, the simple model that we want to keep and whether it, it shouldn't be handled as uh, like a, an external script that should be called or something like that to avoid cluttering the tool with more and more use cases that are being handled in, in bizarre ways. So we try to have like one way to do things and only one and not clutter with many uh, features. So sometimes it's a little bit to find the right balance here. But I guess it's a, a challenge that many open source projects are, are facing. So it's really easy to get started. Um, in just um, an hour, you can have uh, built your file system for the Raspberry Pi or any other board that's supported and run it on your platform, so it's really easy. And it's pretty efficient. Uh, the build times are quite reasonable, as I've shown. Um, just use a reasonable machine. If you use like VirtualBox on a very crappy machine, of course, it's gonna take a while. But other than that, it's pretty efficient. Um, okay, I guess it's time for questions. Uh, if you ask questions, please speak clearly and loudly. I'm not a native speaker, so if you like grumble, um, I'm not going to understand. Yes, please. I wanted to ask how many lines of configuration you use. It showed two examples, and um, I'm wondering how many lines of configuration did each of those two examples require? Um, so the true real world, so the question is how many lines of configuration each of the, uh, the real world examples I've shown required? Is that your question? Yes. Um, so if you take a dot config, it contains many lines of code because it has the value for each option, just like in the Linux kernel. Uh, the one I've shown is the result of running make save dev config, which creates a dev config file that only contains the option for which you've chosen the non-default value. Okay, so that's what makes them relatively short. Uh, for those uh, systems that I've shown, um, basically just count the number of words, more or less. Like, the tool chain is gonna be one option, Linux kernel is gonna be maybe five, six to select the right version and config, BuzzyBox is one option, Drawber is one, Qt is a bunch more, like uh, maybe five, 10 options. Um, each of Zlib, libxml2, logrotate, pppds, trace uh, are going to be one option each. The Qt application is one. So as you can see, it's gonna be maybe like, I don't know, 30, 40 lines or something like that. And this one is a little bit bigger because it has x.org, but it's going to be maybe 60, 70 lines of code of config, but you don't write it. I mean, nobody writes, well, I do write them from time to time, but <laughs> nobody writes that thing. It's, the, it's generated by menu config. So you just navigate in the, in the menus here and select whatever you want, just like when you configure your kernel and you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, for any newcomers, I think this project's really cool. Um, I was wondering if there's like a global to-do list 
list for things that newcomers should target, like if they want to get into developing the project? Okay, so the question is, uh, well, first, uh, thanks for uh, thinking the tool is great for newcomers. And the question is, is there a to-do list? Um, yes, there are different opportunities for newcomers to do things. Um, uh, they are, uh, there is, we have a wiki on lnx.org um, for build roots, and it has a small to-do list. It's not that big, but it's, well, quite, um, it has a few things. Uh, we have reports from the previous meetings that always list a huge number of things to, to do and uh, report the discussion that we had. So for newcomers, it's an, a good way of like seeing what are the topics currently in discussion and maybe jump in in some of the topics. And um, then we have uh, all the patches are recorded in a tool called Patchwork. Um, and it's, anybody can look at them and maybe grab one of the patch, test it, uh, review it and, and give feedback. That's something we're um, uh, missing quite quite a lot at the moment, a uh, review of patches. Um, and then we also have a bug tracker, but it's probably a bit trickier for, uh, for newcomers to directly tackle bugs. And then, um, as usual, just uh, scratch your own itch and build a root file system for your device, do things, and you'll probably figure out that something should be updated or improved and things like that. Other questions? Yes, please. The recipes for the individual packages look very much like ports. Like uh, the BSD port system, it's a fragment of a make file with uh, an include. I'm wondering if you can't steal from the various port systems or Gen2 oh, with so respect to building a new package that is concurrently in the system. So um, I'm being told that the recipes, like the make files, look very similar to the ones of the FreeBSD ports or Gen2 recipes and so on. Yes, all, and, and, and that's the same for other Embedded Linux build systems. I mean, if you look at uh, Yocto, Open Embedded, PTX, Gist, and so on, they all have this kind of recipe language. Uh, and we don't directly reuse what the others are doing. As we don't copy-paste what they're doing, but we look a lot at what others are doing. And I believe they are doing the same because I know some other build systems are reusing some of the patches that we have and so on. So there's a lot of reuse, but it's not direct reuse because the syntax is different. Um, the variable names are different and so on, but there is a lot of reuse. I mean, I'm currently working on improving the Python cross-compilation support. I'm talking with a guy from Canonical doing work on Python in Ubuntu, um, and I'm in interacting with other build systems, also cross-compiling Python. So we are interacting with other projects, but we, it's more, much more difficult to directly reuse recipes. Um, so the question is, um, what, between internal and external, what should I choose? It, internal seems to, be, seems to take quite a while to build. Uh, so yes, indeed, internal is going to build binutils, then going to build all the dependencies of GCC, then going to build GCC like three times and build the C library, so it takes a while. Um, I, on my side, I mainly use external tool chains. Uh, some of them I've, I produce with build root itself. So I use build root once to build a tool chain, and only that. I keep a copy of it somewhere, and then I use that, that tool chain as an external tool chain in build root. And I have a good number of them for each of the architectures that I care about. Um, so that's typically the way I, I do things. But I know some people stick with the internal tool chain because they don't rebuild it um, every day. Uh, you build it once, and then you do more modification to your configuration, and only maybe at night you're going to restart the build from scratch. So Of course, yes. Whenever you do a make clean, it's going to rebuild everything. So you'll have to rebuild the tool chain again. So build root has a very simple approach to uh, configuration changes. It simply doesn't track them. So when you do a configuration change, um, if you add a package, it's going to notice because, well, it's not installed, so it, it should be installed. But if you like, remove a package from the configuration, it's not going to remove it from your target root file system. It, other systems do that. We don't do it simply because it would add too much complexity to the core. Last question, uh, last question in the back. Can I use build root without a network connection? So the question is, can I use build root without a network connection? Um, 
I, I will say yes, but at some point you will need a network connection to grab the tarballs once. But we have a lot of um, uh, well mechanisms to help you um, uh, do offline builds. So we have um, make source, which is going not to trigger the build, but only the downloads of each, each of the tarballs that are needed. We have make external depths, which is going to spit out the list of the, the tarballs that you need to do an offline build. Um, we can we store all of the tarball in a specific location, but you can also give what we call a primary site, which is an HTTP server where Build Root will fetch tarballs instead of going to the web. So like in your company, you can have one internal HTTP server with all the tarballs that you care about and be completely isolated from the rest of the world. So that's a pretty common requirement in some companies. So I think we support that quite well. Well, okay. thank you very much for your attention.